Um, greetings of peace to all. Um, I want to begin with uh, a favorite saying of the Prophet Muhammad, which is that um, uh, the one who cannot give thanks to his or her fellow human beings can't possibly express gratitude to God. Um, so I want to join my voice with those who have come before me in the acknowledgement of country um, and what the ancestors of this great land uh, teach us uh, about what it means to be just connected with one another and connected with this earth on which we so uh, radically depend. Um, I also want to thank uh, everyone at uh, Australian Catholic University and my friends and the various his med institutions for their generous invitation for me to travel here to this beautiful country in this beautiful city of Melbourne uh, to be with you today. Um, uh, I was told I have 10 minutes uh, uh, and uh, I promise to stay strictly to that time, but I hope that's not too long. Um, I've had the fascinating experience and professional uh, and personal privilege of learning about and participating in the Hizmet movement for nearly 15 years now. And when I say fascinating experience, I'm speaking primarily as a student of Islamic history and societies. As such, my encounter with the Hizmet movement has given me an extraordinary opportunity to witness firsthand what I am convinced will come to be recognized as a genuinely watershed moment in the history of Muslim renewal and reform movements, a history which stretches back to the very earliest period in the formation of Muslim societies. I'll have a bit more to say about his met as a renewal and reform movement in a moment when I attempt to say a few words about the individual uh, after whom the chair uh, we are inaugurating today or re-inaugurating re today uh, is named and whose extraordinary piety and dedication and compassionary capacity for visionary servant leadership has placed him at the center of this Hizmet movement, uh, namely uh, Mr. Fethullah Gülen. When I say privilege, a personal and professional privilege, I'm speaking more as an individual Roman Catholic Christian whose life has been immeasurably enriched by over 30 years of dialogic relationship with Muslims, and especially my many Muslim friends, colleagues, and acquaintances in the Hizmet movement worldwide. I'm also speaking as someone who's been blessed with the opportunity and challenge of facilitating a program in Catholic Muslim studies at the largest Catholic Graduate School of Theology and Ministry in the US, Catholic Theological Union. In the early stages of building this program, it became clear to my Muslim and Christian colleagues at CTU, as we call ourselves, uh, uh, one of whom uh, at the time was my dear friend uh, and colleague, Professor Edmund Shia, uh, and myself, that the participation of Muslim students in the program, especially as interreligious dialogue concentrators in our newly inaugurated at that time MA uh, in, in interreligious dialogue, that they would be key to its success. We saw the way in which, though few in number, the Muslim students we were blessed to have did far more teaching about Islam and Christian-Muslim relations than we faculty, uh, both Christian and Muslim, could ever do within the confines of the classroom, whether that classroom be face-to-face -face or online. The presence of our Muslim students created an invaluable habitus of dialogue in the broader life of the institution, which would have been utterly impossible to realize without them. I mention this in the context of articulating, articulating what a privilege it has been to be in relationship with the Hizmet movement, because from the very beginning, my colleagues in Hizmet appreciated what we were trying to accomplish with this program at CTU. And they committed to recruiting superb young men and women from their community to enroll at CTU and gift us with their intelligence, their compassion, their diligence, their humor, and their wisdom. Those of us who are students of Islamic history learn fairly early on in our studies that one of the distinguishing features of renewal and reform movements in Muslim history is that they're often centered around the leadership of a male charismatic figure, oftentimes a religious scholar noted for his piety and vision. And this is true from the time of the Abbasid Revolution in the mid-8th century to the Sunni revival in the 11th century, the movement of Ahmad Sirhindi and Shah Waliullah in the subcontinent, Ma Ming Shin and Xinjiang, the list goes on and on. Uh, these individuals are often seen as mujtahidun, uh, a word which means able to exercise a particular uh, a, a ability to uh, interpret Islamic norms and values in changing circumstances. And a mujaddidun, someone who 
rooted in that ability is actually able to help the community um, renew its commitment to its faith and keep that commitment uh, vital in the ongoing dynamics of continuity and change that characterize the history of almost every religious tradition of which I am familiar. And from this uh, flows the central uh, ethic uh, in the case of the charismatic figure at the heart of the Hizmet movement, Petr Le Gulen. Um, many things can be said, but the mutually critical and mutually enhancing engagement of tradition and modernity and of faith and reason are probably two of the most notable hallmarks of his leadership as a mujtahid and a mujaddid, right? As a visionary interpreter of Islamic norms and values and therefore as a renewer of, of, of people, someone who facilitates people's renewal of their commitment to their faith. From this flows the central ethic of service, which is actually what the word hizmet uh, means, uh, rooted in education, dialogue, and civic engagement, with a focus on inclusivity, charitable giving, disaster relief, peace building, and social justice activism. As I list these things, um, I, I, I'm attempting to uh, at least allude to uh, synergies that have already been referenced, synergies between the teachings of uh, Petr de Gulen and those of uh, His Holiness Pope Francis. Um, particularly uh, evident to me are an emphasis on what we in the Catholic tradition call the preferential option for the poor. Um, on Francis's particularly uh, uh, strong emphasis on what I would call a spirituality of inclusivity. Um, and, and also this captivating notion, captivating at least for me, of the church being a field hospital uh, in the world. Um, I think he means that in, in a literal sense uh, because there are actually people who are dying and suffering physically uh, and the church needs to attend to those people. But also in a broader sense in terms of the culture wars uh, that, that rend our societies um, and that threaten to tear them apart in so many different ways. I, I speak to that quite conscious of the fact that I come from the United States where um, we're seeing may perhaps more clearly uh, some of the deep divisions that have been in our society for a very, very long time. Um, I, I think uh, the other synergy is that, that uh, for Pope Francis, the connection between being a field hospital um, and education and dialogue uh, are actually essential. And he, he talks about that specifically in reference to uh, Christian-Muslim relations in Evangeli Gaudium. Uh, his met has helped us at CTU uh, live into this notion of being a field hospital um, for all those who are injured and wounded uh, in a process of, of gradual reconciliation by the power of God's spirit. Um, and, and the stories of this are too many to, to recount. Um, I know even from my limited time here in Melbourne how his met is doing this uh, in Australia in general uh, and in Melbourne in particular. Last night, I was at a dinner um, meeting two lovely people who are pivotal figures in the Australian Rationalist Justice Society. Society. Um, and, and these are folks who are uh, atheists in the sense that they feel uh, uh, deeply committed uh, to a thoroughgoing critique of religion, and particularly religious belief, as antiquated, unscientific, and by implication, irrational. Um, and uh, I found myself in, in an awkward position of, of, of at moments in these conversations feeling very uncomfortable, um, which is good, uh, obviously, um, because it was stretching me in, in, in many ways. But what was remarkable about it was that this meeting between me as a believing Roman Catholic, a historian of religions, and these you know, wonderful people from the Australian Rationalist Society was facilitated by the people of Hizmet. Well, what, what better way to live into the ethic of being a field hospital um, in, in, in the culture wars than that? Um, I want to say how extraordinary it is to me uh, that the Hizmet movement continues to pursue these goals uh, in the face of the extraordinary injustices uh, that are being perpetrated on them in the, the country of origin of this movement, uh, a beautiful country with a beautiful people, Turkey. Um, 
And um, I ask that we keep uh, all those suffering people uh, in our prayers. Uh, but also in a spirit of prayer, um, I, I'd really like to give thanks to uh, ACU uh, and the His Med Institutions for coming together to create uh, this initiative uh, here at uh, ACU. There's a Quranic verse that says, uh, oh humanity, uh, we, God is speaking in the uh, first person plural, we created you from one male and one female and appointed you to, uh, as tribes and nations so that you may come to know one another. Uh, verily, the most noble among you is the most God conscious. And as someone involved in dialogue, especially Christian Muslim dialogue for the last 30 years, uh, I can't help but see the connection that that verse seems to be uh, trying to communicate to its hearers between coming to know one another, human relationality, um, and a stronger consciousness of God. Um, and I think that what you're doing here at ACU uh, is a wonderful and inspiring embodiment uh, of this ideal. And I circle back to that hadith verse as I started and thank God by thanking you for this inspiring moment. <laughs>